Welcome everybody to ASO MOOC 2017 Gamification of Digital Skills and tonight's presentation is by Brant Knudsen, Mr. KCAS um, and it, you should have gotten a note card with the landmarks and all that kind of stuff but we can hand out the landmarks as we go as well. This hour-long presentation will be a hands-on speed dating tour of a range of gamified educational activities set up to guide students as they develop the user interface skills required to navigate, build, and capture video in the virtual world. Key issues such as virtual identity, social constructivism, support for reflective thinking, support for reflective thinking, and integration with the Moodle course will be examined for impact on game design and student motiv motivation. I want to tell you a little bit about our speaker starting around 2007. Brandt it has introduced over a thousand students to the limitless world of virtual environments from leading design classes with secondary students, e-learning courses with MSC IT in education students, and developing experiential training for medical students. Brandt has built upon the affordances of the virtual world of Second Life to address a wide range of intended learning outcomes. If you head over to the SL MOOC later on, you can headquarters later on, you'll be able to pick up a longer note card with a longer description of what we're going to do. And anybody who doesn't have um, anybody who doesn't have the notebook with the, the gamification uh, landmarks on it, I'll just start passing it out after I turn things over to Brant. So Brant, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Maggie. Well, we'll just uh, get started really quickly here because as, uh, as the note said, it's um, going to be a speed dating tour. I had a lot I wanted to cover and, and didn't want to take up more than an hour or so. Just a quick uh, run through on this room. Um, it's kind of my dream classroom with uh, laptops one-to-one uh, -one for each student um, and there's group uh, oriented screens around the room so each group can take over a screen and uh, and set and find a website do research and talk about it and then they can uh, display on the, each screen as groups go around the room and and share with each other um, on the big screen in the front here is the uh, my technology mediated learning model of learning in a virtual world um, building on prior TAM based technology acceptance models and uh, you can see there's uh, seven um, constructs in the middle there, presence, virtual identity, motivation, cognitive benefits, active learning, social constructivism, and reflective thinking. And that's, uh, I've added two constructs there, which I'm attempting to prove using structural equation modeling. That's my doctoral thesis. But anyways, um, let's go on to the next uh, place, um, gamified learning, the quest. So everybody, if you could flip back to the, uh, Either the note card or the list of uh, links on the presentation. We should go to the quest for our next um, our next context. Okay, so let's all go. I guess I could put it into the um, chat. So that's the link we're going to go to. And you can also drop that in your ad. Now right, let's make sure everybody left. I just lost Brant and a few people from the voice server. There's only Maggie and Vin out on it now. Yeah, everybody everybody has gone to the new location. Let me give you the the uh, landmark. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to help Gerard. Gerard. <laughs> you probably think I'm a nutcase, right? <laughs> no, it's okay. I gave him the one. Uh, okay, uh, let me. Way. <laughs> okay, I'll give him the one as. That's funny. Him that as well. try the quest, kind of uh, invited beta testers, and I, I may have been her, I can't, honestly, I can't remember um, how it developed, who su someone suggested, well, why don't you open it up, because there are people that like to do this, um, people that are in hunt clubs. So that's kind of how it opened up to the world. Originally, I just developed, as I said, for a single class, 
But then I opened it up to the whole world to try and ended up getting around 2,000 people coming through <coughs> the quest to, uh, to try it and see um, what it's like. Apparently, it's been quite a success. People seem to enjoy it. So as you can see, it starts with the, uh, the genie lamp here. You touch the genie lamp, and it offers you a clue. Thanks, Liar. And uh, up pops um, clue number one. And if you take a look at that, um, it reads kind of like a cross between Dr. Seuss and Shakespeare. I think somebody <laughs> told me one of those left-handed compliments, I think. Um, so the first one, over the castle drawbridge and into the yard, turn left and walk to the trees. It's not hard. The door on the left with an arch of white roses leads into the church founded by Moses. So a little bit of a, you know artistic license there. Um, and uh, it goes on for several more stanzas, but the idea is to challenge them. Don't forget these are all second language uh, English learners, so the English alone is a bit of a challenge to decode. And then the idea was to get them to follow the clue. Okay, I'm not on. broadcasting so anymore. about five more minutes, I think, on my schedule here. Yep. So let's uh, go ahead and walk along if there's anybody that's uh, never been here before. Um, and this is the place where Val and Fidget and a, a few other very nice uh, volunteers, mostly from the librarians group, um, took up docent positions. And that was where Fidget stood right there. Fidget, you don't want to show them your pirate woman outfit instead of the cat? Up to you. But um, yeah, one of the horses is still here. Um, the black stallion, Romeo, got sick. So he's uh, sleeping in an attic right now until I figure out what's wrong with him. But, um, so the idea was to go over the drawbridge, uh, walk through here, and you can see there's a lot of other things um, put here by Desi, mostly from the Literature Alive people, um, Camelot kind of things like this sword and the stone, which is frankly a little bit uh, distracting sometimes to people. They, they think, well, should I be doing all the King Arthur or Beowulf stuff? In the castle, there's a bunch of other things for Beowulf. But I just decided it would be, you know, kind of an option, interesting um, added features. But if they stay on the, the clue, then they should turn left and walk through the trees. up these basic skills and hopefully have fun at the same time. I think we may have a, a quester in action right here as a live demo. So you can see this was a, a takeoff on a Catholic church. Um, almost everything that you see around you I picked up for free on the marketplace. Uh, this was a, or, or very cheaply. I think this was very cheap uh, Catholic altar display, and the clue asks us to fly up over Jesus and Mary. So we go up, figure out how to navigate through the beams, and come down. And it's amazing to me how many people have a hard time with this. Now, we do get a fair number of newbies, people who are, are, have never been here before. And you can see on the clue where it talks about the where the cursor becomes hand. And if you do hover over the wall here on the on the right side, um, it should actually say secret door, right? That's, <laughs> that's the label, secret door. Fidget, always the first to go, right? And uh, so it's pretty, uh, the idea is for everybody to succeed. And that's really the challenge with gamified learning is to make it fun, <clears throat> yet educational. So there's a balance there. And then how hard do you make it yet hopefully everybody can succeed. You don't really want anybody to drop out and fail and go away mad. So the idea is to uh, make it fun, yet everybody can get in. So now it's pretty clearly we're in a secret place. Just by the shape of the room, it's kind of unusual. And you can see there's a treasure chest here. It's going to be a little crowded if we all get in here. Um, there's a treasure chest here with uh, gender-specific gifts, a girl's top. And a guy's shirt, and the treasure chest opens and closes. So that's the first opportunity for them to get a reward, a thing, a free 
part of an outfit they can build and then you can see the magic door straight ahead so they click on the magic door and it, it uses a, a sit pose to take you to the next location let's all go through hopefully we'll have time everybody click on the magic door to change your viewpoint Part of the uh, Second Life etiquette, right, is to step out of the way once once you've transported. You know more people are coming. Just kind of step aside. And there's a little bunk bed there, well, a covered bed actually, uh, and that's from Captain Nemo's uh, submarine. Uh, Allie uh, had a huge amount of stuff she put in the marketplace for free, and um, this is one of the many great things she made that decorated much of uh, of the quest. So yeah, the magic doors are very cool. Um, it, it's a way to separate you from the prior context so that uh, you don't have all the different questers running around bumping into each other and following each other. So I wanted to break them away, kind of like spinning somebody and uh, pin the tail on the donkey. And you have to reorient yourself once you've teleported. You can't go by your prior clues. You can't know in your mind where your goal was before. You have to figure it out starting fresh. So there's a new genie lamp. Clue number two, and it opens up another note card with another clue, and there's ten clues. And then at, at the end of the tenth clue, I congratulate people in a skybox, and then I try to uh, tempt them to do my survey by saying, I've got an eleventh level. And if you do the eleventh, the amazing um, undersea world of the zombie pirates, I think I called it. <clears throat> you can't hear me, Lear? Can anybody, can everybody else hear me? Yeah. My audio working okay good mm -hmm. so the idea was to incentivize the survey and I did that by building a 11th level with much input from my uh, my six-year-old son at the time <laughs> to make it fun and uh, around 20% of the people who come through the quest do the survey and then only about 10% of that total number of surveys collected were junk so I had to throw away about well maybe about 20 20 percent of them were junk where they would just rush through the survey doing whatever answers um, in order to get the link to the uh, 11th level um, just like when you give out surveys in in, in the real yeah. world um, if you stand there um, with your notepad or your uh, clipboard and ask nicely you, you get much higher rates of uh, of response and much uh, less likely to get junk so I, I spent a lot of time in world here helping the students, helping the people who come through and um, chatting with people, kind of debriefing them too as, as, I, as they went along. What were you thinking here and what did you think of the quest? And it's just an opportunity to get some feedback. Um, but that does definitely increase your uh, likelihood of getting good data. Thanks, Fidget, for typing along. I appreciate that. Um, XO, so glad you could make it. Um, hopefully you won't get lost, left behind here. We're about to go to the next one. I'm the on an unfamiliar computer and unfamiliar viewer. <laughs> well, um, we'll try to, uh, can, can anybody uh, to open up a chat line with XO and try to uh, help him if he gets lost and maybe pass him uh, URL links if necessary. I will try to drop in the URL links into the main chat line as well. So this is uh, along the way of the quest. We're um, now in a, a little a water wheel house, and there's 10 total steps in the, in the quest. But it's about time to go on to the next one, which is the pirate ship battle. I will drop that URL into chat, and then let's all go. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> did, did, did you sit in the front of the room or the back of the room when you were a student? Quick question for you. Both at the same time? <laughs> okay, so um, we're up on a uh, cliff area. I'm sure you did. Uh, we're up a 
Bay. Huh? Forget there's a freebie here. Now the bird, um, the giant parrot up here, if you click on him, it'll offer to give you a freebie. It'll give you the clue 11. So you're all welcome to get your own, your own um, freebies. Let me put on my pirate outfit real quick here while I run through this. Dark with my parrot. So I'm going to wear my pirate outfit to add to the context. So you can see here we have a, a big ship coming in with a lot of guns, 50 guns. And then off to the sides of the cove, there's three little brown ships, which I believe are little pirate ships. And then on the other side here, you have the three, on their near foreground, you have the three little white ships, which are um, old American uh, flags here. You can see the don't tread on me. It's an old, old flag that dated uh, before the current American flag. But anyways, the idea here is that I wanted to teach the students how to develop camera controls, how to zoom, how to pan, how to use the alt and the control keys to uh, pull back and change their view. Um, and that's a difficult thing to teach, um, very hands-on, uh, do exactly what I do in the classroom. And also, it's very boring. But it, I thought that I could build a game with the learning outcome of teaching that. Um, and this is what I came up with was um, if you stand here on the cliff and click on the, the different um, cannons you can see on the pirate, you can see that it will shoot. So anybody should be, be able to click on it. But you can only fight one side of the ship at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and the joy here, the intrinsic value, is getting to see things burn and explode into bits, which you know I think is, appeals to just about everybody, although I'm sure some people will deny it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but to do it well, to really succeed, um, it helps if you have camera control and you can then take different viewpoints. You can fire from both sides of the ship, fire from the back. But there's some um, cannons pointing out the back of the ship, <coughs> cannons in the front. And the goal is to sink all six of those ships at the same time. So they should all be burning and, and explode and gone before any are reborn. And uh, so that's the goal. And the idea here, which I haven't really built on yet, is that when that happens, when the um, six ships are destroyed, a beacon will light up, taking you to the next clue, which if you use your camera controls and you look down in the water below us, directly in the ocean below us, you'll see Captain Nemo's submarine. Can everybody see that? And that is where the, um, the magic door is hidden in Captain Nebo's um, cabin. So uh, that's what I'll be building on later. But the idea here was to not only train camera controls, but I also made it quite difficult to succeed here and destroy all six ships at the same time unless you can form a group. So the idea next step <coughs> is to foster social constructivism, where students would um, form ad hoc groups, kind of like World of Warcraft, where you just meet up with people who are um, close to you in the same stage of, of exploring this game, and form groups and um, divvy up the roles. OK, you fight at the left side. I'll fight the right side. You fire the forward, forward cannons. You fire the backward facing cannons. Fight as a team, definitely. If they do that, they're much more likely to succeed and then move on ahead. I also plan to um, support this with an asynchronous online discussion forum where if the clues get really hard and students, people, cannot actually succeed on first try, they could go and discuss with others um, and try to get clues from other people and maybe form a team and say, we'll all come at this certain time, or who can help me now? Maybe I'll incorporate a real-time chat. <coughs> people could um, say, I need help. Can, some, can people come join me? So um, not only is it um, the initial learning outcome of camera controls, but then social constructivism um, and supporting learning with uh, multiple modes of um, communication, not only here in the real-time chat of Second Life, but also an asynchronous online forum, probably Moodle. So that is the. Um, 
the pirate ship battle. Um, that's kind of what part of what I plan to do eventually as Quest 2, the next generation of Quest. <laughs> Good, Excel. Glad you made it. <coughs> I recognize your pirate voice even in chat. Um, any questions before we move on? Okay. <laughs> Liar. Glad you could uh, come. Um, all right. So if there's no no um, questions popping up, let's see. I guess I could go back through chat. Uh, no big no questions there. So let's go on to the um, the next link, which is the lab fire safety. So I will put that in the chat. Oh, very good, Fidget. Let's all go on to lab fire. Okay, and I'll give you a bit of time to uh, let everything res, but um, I'm going to put on my histo HUD before Fidget does. <laughs> I'm putting on a HUD. You can see the green sign here it says, get your HUD here. Click here to get a histopathology HUD. Click on the keep button and then open your inventory. The button on the left, it looks like a little suitcase. Type HUD and then double click it to wear. So um, that's the first obvious clue that w what students need to do. Now this was designed to train medical students in lab fire safety. Now the existing methodology for training them was a three hour PowerPoint with a pre-recorded voice. Wow. They were supposed to sit and focus on intently for three hours, maybe as part of the hazing of, you know, of the medical students. <laughs> but the idea was to make it more fun, more interesting, more interactive. So we developed three um, safety routines, fire safety, chemical safety, and biological safety. Um, you can see that on the next green sign here. I'll walk up to it. And uh, you click on the sign that you want. OK. So someone's already in there. All right, well, I guess I didn't go quick enough. Um, if anybody has the HUD and started fire safety, there you go. Um, go ahead and, and use the HUD and step in and, and follow along. Okay, so whoever's uh, got the HUD on and loads fire safety, it'll prompt you through a series of uh, yes, no questions. And now it's notice the fire alarm is flashing because what they were supposed to click on was the fire alarm out here outside the room. So whoever's running the HUD, could they click on the fire alarm? Okay, good. And then the next one, I believe, was the fire extinguisher. So if we all go inside and step around to the left here, now you can see all the equipment is based on photographs of real labs. So even down to the post-it notes on the equipment and the handwritten notes and the uh, inspection um, notices, uh, it's all very recognizable to the students who would actually be training here. Is this, oh, I know this equipment. I know what we're supposed to do here. So the idea is to familiarize them with the real life lab and also make them feel more comfortable here in the second life version. So the next step in the uh, HUD is to asking them to identify this particular fire extinguisher here. Now, if they don't click on the fire extinguisher, it'll flash green. So whoever's got the HUD on, could click on something else around the room. Uh huh. Anybody have the HUD on? Okay. Let me put the HUD on. Morgane, come. Go ahead and come inside to the lab here. And I will try to load up the fire safety. OK, so I'm going to step through this rapidly. I think somebody took off there. OK, so I'm clicking on the fire alarm. And then I'm clicking Next. And I'm going in the door. And I'm clicking Next. 
I'm supposed to identify the three fire extinguishers around the room. So it, we're trying to train students to spot the yeah. fire extinguishers and be aware of their locations. Now it asks you to click on the oh, fire extinguisher cool. on the left side of the second bench. Now if they click on anything else, the fire extinguisher, the object of whichever object they're being asked to identify will flash in a very bright and obvious way. So if, can everybody see the fire extinguisher flashing yeah. green here? So again, the idea here is that nobody's nobody's left behind, right? Very American phrase. Um, everybody can su can su succeed and uh, identify that. So now, when I click on this flashing green, when it says yes, that's right. If you see a small lab fire, you can use the fire extinguisher or a fire blanket. If you feel confident, you can do so with no personal risk. So that's to keep the insurance people happy. The next prompt says, do you see the water sprinklers on the ceiling? So if everybody cams up here on the ceiling, you can see some water sprinklers. Now, I made them a little bit larger than normal because it's easy to see. And then it asks, can you identify the fire safety violation preventing their effective use? Anybody, can you type in the chat what you think is the fire safety violation preventing the effective use of water sprinklers? Any ideas? And normally this would be done individually or someone leading a group. Um, so people can be following along as you are. Exactly, Maggie. The boxes up there underneath are too, are piled up too high. So that's an example. Same with the PowerPoint warns you about that kind of things. Things that build up over time and people don't realize it's blocking the fire extinguishers, the sprinklers, sorry. So now that I do click on it, says yes, that's a fire safety violation, good work, click on next, and says okay, are you ready for the fire safety scenario to begin? Click on the Bunsen burner. So now I'll walk over there, sorry, fidget. The Bunsen burner is right here in the middle of this second bench, and if I click on it, it lights as it should. Ah. And this bottle that was stored ah. next to it also lights up. Uh -oh. because the cap was off. So, oh no, the ethanol bottle cap was off and the fumes have ignited a small fire. What should you do? So this is in my HUD. It's prompting me with these, these uh, questions. And I have uh, choices for one, two, and three. One, run out of the lab. Two, run out of the lab and then activate the fire alarm. Or three, try putting up a small fire with a fire extinguisher. And here, we're trying to teach students, don't just run away at the first sign of trouble. Try to deal with it so that a small fire doesn't become a large fire. So the correct answer here, now I'm going to click on the wrong answer. And it says in red, no, if a small fire happens and you feel confident you can put it out, you should try putting it out with the fire extinguisher. So now it asks me to find and click on the fire extinguisher. And I will click on the one on the left. And you'll see that the fire extinguisher will fly over here. This was the easiest way for us to do it rather than try to have the avatar hold it and then force the avatar. It fires. The ethanol bottle falls over. Uh-oh. Oh, no big fire is going to happen here. What should you do now? And you can see the boxes are catching fire, kind of illustrating this idea of a safety violation. And what should we do? Should we continue trying to put out the fire? No, that's the wrong answer. So we're trying to get the students to differentiate between small problems that they can deal with or big problems which they should run away. So the, the first choice is run out of the lab. The second choice is run out of the lab and activate the fire alarm. We definitely want students to alert the building to any problems, any safety issues. So I click on number two, and it says, yes, that's right. So you should run out of the, out of the lab. So let's all step away from the giant fire. Sorry, Morgane. And you can see there's other um, equipment around, but let's uh, let's go ahead and step out for now, and I'll discuss some of that later. So we step outside and click on next. It says find and click on the fire alarm. So here's the fire alarm. And I click on it, and you should hear that fire alarm noise. Yeah. So again, we're cool. trying to use the affordances of Second Life to use the audio here. And if everybody looks back into the room, everybody looking back in the lab, you can see the fire. And when I click on next, then everything goes back to the way it should. 
And my HUD tells me your performance has been logged and will be reviewed if you're an HKU student. You can see your final score. So it shows me I got 8 out of 10 correct. And it does log that along with your number. It can, it can save your uh, avatar name. Um, and we have also developed two other um, safety scenarios, one for chemical safety and one for <coughs> safety. So you're all welcome to try this on your own um, at another time. We don't have time for everybody to go through it today, but um, there is three, uh, two other scenarios for three total. And there's things in there like a working shower. There's the shower working over there and an eye wash. It'll do those things. Um, and there's people in there with agonized expressions on their faces because they got doused with a, a chemical, a caustic chemical in their face. <clears throat> so um, any questions about the histopathology uh, lab fire safety tour? This was the fire safety, and then um, actually I started building another lab across the way with some other equipment. And the long-term goal is to train the students in the safety issues for each piece of equipment. So they can come in and run um, very expensive equipment in a virtual form um, and not worry about breaking it. So uh, I hope so, uh, Lyad. I hope they um, have found it to be more interesting and exciting. Um, the professors who run this and originally uh, helped me uh, with the proposal and uh, were my co-investigators, um, I think they're pretty busy people. So I haven't done, uh, haven't done, I haven't followed this up much with uh, surveys, but I built it with on a uh, teaching development grant, and we've had uh, maybe 20 students come in and try it so far. Um, and I do want to give credit to the Swift um, build. I believe it was Leicester University had the Swift. Mm -hmm. Um, build with their laboratory, and that gave me a lot of ideas about how to set up an interactive um, simulation using a HUD. Um, so I did hire a, a HUD specialist, um, very good programmer named uh, Don Bickley. Um, if anybody wants to do um, work uh, or you need a HUD built, please um, contact me. I'll put my Either contact me here um, in Second Life, or I'll put my email address and uh, contact me about Don Bickley. Great HUD coder. He works at uh, the University of Alaska, um, but uh, he did some moonlight work for me to build a HUD here. OK. So this is uh, Hong Kong Used Medicine Island, and there's uh, several other um, <coughs> features on this island, including um, a patient diagnosis, which is where we're supposed to be. We're running a little behind. So let's uh, bring up the presentations list for the MOOC and load up the patient diagnosis and drop it into chat. There you go. So. Um, Fidget's already loaded that, so if we all click on that and go to page, patient diagnosis. We all change into my scrubs. Okay, so this is the patient diagnosis area. Um, and you can see that there's five patients set up here in a row. Uh, if I open up these curtains, you can see some of the other patients down that way. So there's five patients in this ward. And the patient here in front of us is diabetes. Princess Di, we call her. Um, has it res for you guys, or should I go more slowly and give you time to, to res your surroundings? Yes, her name is Diabetes. Okay, so we're not trying to hide what their, um, 
what their illness is, but we are trying to get the students to uh, look at uh, information when they, when patients have come in, when the patients have been um, given, um, looked over in the waiting room, or now that they're in the hospital, they've been admitted, we want them to be aware of their ongoing treatment. So if you click on the clipboard at the foot of the bed, you'll see it zooms into a Google document which I can't see at the moment, but uh, it should say, um, oh, it should talk about Princess Di here and her ongoing treatment um, and the, all the different um, medicines she's received and the different ongoing uh, diagnosis um, and information about this patient. Um, there's also uh, computer equipment over here where you can set things. Let's see if I go ahead and set her SpO2 and set her heart rate, uh, like that, and then, uh oh she's dead, can everybody hear that? <laughs> so you can do things like uh, practice with the um, shock paddles, you know, the defibrillator, I should turn that off, but you can uh, set up all kinds of um, symptoms here, and you can uh, store information easily on the Google document, which can easily be updated, as you know, from outside of Second Life. Um, and the idea is that um, students can come in as a group and look the patient over, check her ongoing um, details, um, and then rather than hassle each uh, patient with uh, lots of questions, the idea was that I could simulate a patient interview over here in this next room. Open up this door. step was to come over here and sit down and on that white screen for the year of the study we had a, a, a subscription service to a bot um, kind of program which um, we, you can put whatever face you want on it and then it talks I think it came out of Stanford um, so you, students would come in here in their groups of four or five and then they would sit and they would watch this video recorded interview rather than wake up a patient or keep asking the patient the same questions over and over to train students, they can do a video interview and store it here separately from the patient and view it as a group and discuss her symptoms, also more privacy, right, rather than talk about, well, do you think this is a terminal illness? They could do that away from the, the patient, the privacy of this little conference room. So each patient had their own video recorded interview and uh, each patient has their own little um, associated conference room. So we could have five different groups of, of medical students, each looking at different patients and each discussing in their own little rooms here um, and talking about their diagnosis and developing a diagnosis. So that was the idea here. Very cool. Um, and that, that really, frankly, I developed this kind of uh, uh, speculative. I'm thinking this might be something interesting, but uh, it, it never got used. So uh, oh. you never know what professors and our instructors will adopt. But uh, I had a lot of fun building it, and I do have some uh, video recordings. Let me get one of those, and I'll show it to you here real quick. Um, diabetes. I did record it because I knew I was on a limited basis with the uh, – because you have to pay yearly for those subscriptions. And I don't know if, if you guys have ever been on a, a grant, but uh, um, it's hard to keep funding going year to year to year, you know, ma maintaining. So um, let's see if I can find that training for medical students. And then it was under part one, the virtual patient. And sorry, one delay here. There we go. Copy video URL at this time. Okay, so I'll put it into the chat and you can see a little video. There's a link to a YouTube video, so if you want to check that out, it'll show the um, 
a recording of the patient interview. And note that it was an um, interactive process that you can click on the different choices, uh, response one, two, or three. Um, and that way you could kind of feel more in control of the interview rather than just watching a YouTube recording. You could ask for the information from uh, step one and get the information and then talk about it as a group and then ask for the next um, tranche of information in step two and then talk about that. So it kind of gives the groups better control over how much information and what information they're bringing in at any one time. So you can uh, watch the rest of that video on your own. Um, any questions about the patient diagnosis area here, the ward? Thanks, Maggie. I had a lot of fun doing this. Um, this is one of my first builds in Second Life um, for the University of Hong Kong. Um, <coughs> and as you can see, I put it in a giant building. And uh, I don't think I, in this one, I'm going to talk about the ILC tour. But if you came down to the fifth floor, there's a, a whole simulation of a real world facility called the Innovative Learning Center with patients in intensive care and an operating room with open heart surgery, a lot of other things, which you can check out again on your own. Um, and there's a tour that I built with that. Let me get you that link. And that's the ILC tour. There it is. And that would be this link. So the link for the ILC video tour is there. So that'll walk you through that bill down on the fifth floor. Um, I think we're up on the seventh now. OK, did anybody have any questions? OK, now, well, let's go on to the Euro Forest. Um, yes, we're going to go to Lingnan Drama Island. So we're going, everybody should open that up or click on that link and go to the Ure Forest. Bit of time while we, uh, everybody comes in. So this is the Yure Forest. It's based on a real-world uh, place in Japan. Um, this is a place where a lot of Japanese people choose to come and die. So um, it's kind of famous as being a place where people would come to die, wander off into the woods, and either commit, um, what did they used to call it, harakiri, or just uh, take poison, whatever. Um, you can see here in the parking lot, there's a couple of abandoned cars. They've obviously been here for a really long time, kind of implying that their owners are not coming back. Um, people do come and leave tape, uh, long strips of, of yellow tape to try to find their way back. Um, but so you'll see some of that. Um, and where is Niesa? There she is. Niesa, could you walk up, walk here a little bit closer to the group? So Niesa is the builder of this area. Now she helped with um, a prior build, a Get Scrooge build. Um, and when she um, comes up with ideas like this, where she wants to build something, and if I can give her the space, I, I feel like a kind of a gallery uh, operator, where if an artist wants to put up some work, sometimes I'll discuss with her you know, what, what she has in mind. But if I can give her a place to show her work, I do. And so this is entirely the work of Niesa here. Um, and if you have any questions for her, or if you want um, help on a build, um, she, uh, uh, excellent um, background person, designer person. She can. Uh, she does. A, she kind of specializes in um, horror things. Like she, she uh, that house. What was it called, um, Niesa? The house you had for a long time. It was um, the haunted house, um, and that was her her pet project. Um, so she loves the scary, yeah, Slaughter Creek Manor. So um, that's her favorite genre here, and. Uh, 
And the URA kind of uh, goes in that direction without all the uh, corpses and people chasing you around. But um, we have a few minutes. Let's all walk into the into the forest build here just to get a sense of uh, what it's like. Walk in. And you can see the trail starts out somewhat uh, easy to follow. And then as you go farther along, you can see where they kind of blocked it off, no entry. But, uh, you know, people that want to die certainly aren't going to get stopped by a simple little chain like that. So we can wander on into the woods. And you can start to see the yellow tape where people have uh, yeah. left yellow tape in, the, in an effort to f give themselves a clue. They can follow back and if they change their mind, perhaps, and survive. They want Did to survive. Did you see that ghost? <laughs> yes, I think there is a ghost. And that is the kind of the effect we were looking for. Thanks, XO. The idea was that kind of a, what was that? going by to kind of add to the ambiance. So there is a bit of, uh, you know, the scary uh, things to, to add to oh, the yeah. context. Here she was again, but no, yep. But no, uh, no corpses, no, nobody with their guts hanging out. But uh, um, the idea was to develop an ambiance that was true to the original. And there's a few other features. There's a gazebo back here, kind of buried. Um, but if you have any questions, um, I invited Niesa here um, to come and attend if, if anybody has any questions for her or um, just wanted to make contact with her as somebody uh, who's a really talented builder who um, I've been really happy to work with. I feel fortunate to be able to host her work. Jason, do you want to go voice and uh, talk a little bit about what you're, you were thinking or your, what was your motivation when you built this? That was really effective. I was a little freaked out. <laughs> Good, XO. Yes, can hear you fine. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for stopping by. Yes, uh, I've, um, I've been very lucky to have found Brant and he's given me a lot of um, prims to work with and create everything I've wanted to. Any questions for Niesa? Yes, she works um, in materials and with methods that uh, take up a very low prim, prim cost. So wonderful, um, very effective and eerie, and it's um, I think quite effective at yielding the same kind of ambiance that the real place apparently has. How long did it take you, Niesa, to put it, this bill together? Um, oh, probably three days, just with oh. all the little finishing touches. It only took me a day to do the trees, but um, yeah, but a whole day. <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. isn't it, how fast things come together. It's more, yeah. I think, uh, mulling over your ideas and then deciding what to do. That takes more time than the actual doing, as opposed yeah. to the real world. I like to look at as many Google pictures of the creation I'm trying to create and uh, usually it just comes to me after that and uh, the same things happened with my haunted house and it's, it's quite interesting that I, I don't really know what the house looks like on the inside but uh, it just comes together really well and I find out that I've decorated it very similar to the way the real life house was, and it's quite interesting. It's almost like I'm guided. <laughs> Great. So, people that have actually been to the real haunted house have told you that that the your uh, virtual version is similar and decorated in similar ways. Yes, yes. It actually takes on a a bit of a a creepy <laughs> element as well. I yes. I put a lot of sounds in, but some sounds 
I didn't actually put in. <laughs> and that, it's almost like a real haunted house. So Very good. I, I don't know what happened there, but yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if there's any questions for uh, Nyesa, now's the time. Otherwise, let's go on to another one of her bills, Pandora. Okay, so there Fidget has dropped in the Pandora, the link, and let's go on. Okay. Niesa's ideas to build Pandora um, might take a few minutes for it to come in. And I don't know if you guys can hear the thunder in the background here in Hong Kong. We're getting another rainstorm. So if I suddenly disappear, it's because lightning took out my computer. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, the thunder would probably suit well. There's a, a few seats over here. Four. Lotus position. Floating above the seat, if you like. And uh, you notice those big tulip shaped things over there. If you click on them, they start emitting sounds and uh, visuals. So the ones over there to the right of the waterfall, and also way back off to the left of the waterfall. So a bit of interactive uh, puffballs, they're called. Yes, sounds and visuals. Um, and uh, Nies and I agree that the audio is key to building an ambiance. Um, and this is purely uh, Nies with just going with what she wanted to do. Um, not because anybody asked for it or, you know, or certainly that I asked for it, but she wanted to do it, and I think it's really cool, and I'm happy to host uh, a person as creative as Niesa. So perhaps someday I can incorporate this as part of quest number two, right? I could have people come to these uh, incredible builds um, and get exposure to the, to the aesthetics as part of a, a quest which prompts them to go on from challenge to challenge. So kind of like taking them on a tour. Yes, extremely creative. You can feel the beauty of, of her mind, right? What was that movie? It's the beautiful. It's a beautiful mind, or something like that. Yep. Sure, go for it, Gerard. There you go. That's the good thing about the virtual world, right? Students can come here and explore, and not worry about breaking things. So you can bring them in, uh, give them access 24/7 to develop familiarity with a real-life place such as the patient ward or the innovative learning center so that when they do come to the real place they'll feel more um, at home and they won't it'll hopefully it'll reduce their learning curve but a place like this is just uh, beautiful for beauty's sake and i think it does a good job showing the affordances of second life and what you can do um, given all these beautiful toys so I don't think Niesa's created these things, these elements, but um, let's say it's similar an analogy might be going to the paint store and buying beautiful paint, and then it's up to the artist to arrange them and to fulfill their vision. And to share it with 
with the world. So I think she's done an incredible job here. All right, well, hate to uh, cut it short, but let's go on to the next one. Get Scrooged. So I'll put that link in there. Beat you to it. Oh, Fidget, you just barely got it. <laughs> on to Get Scrooged. Okay. Desi and I talking about uh, how we could bring a literature alive, a, f a piece of classic literature, and make it interactive and give students the ability to explore a novel at their own speed. So as opposed to watching a video or reading a book where it's all very sequential, I wanted to create a world in the um, in Second Life, where the students could have decision points, where they choose where to go and they choose what to see, um, and experience the literature at their own pace and in their own way. Um, no, no, no voice. Can anybody hear me? Okay, so Maggie can hear me. So I see waves above my head. Yep. Gerard, can you hear me now? Yeah, I don't think there's audio parcels here. Oh, okay. Perhaps if we all pull over here closer to me, just to make sure there's no audio parcels. Um, and you can see who they are, as I was saying, that Desi and I are two of the contributors, as well as Niesa, who built all this, the settings you see, and Serafina, who um, built all the, um, what she calls mannequins, and other people call uh, NPCs, or non-performing characters. So sit, uh, sitting here at the desk has been uh, Bob Cratchit, and it says, click to hear what I'm thinking. And if you click on him, it's only once a year, sir. It's only <laughs> once a year, sir. You can hear a clip from the movie. Um, and then if you click on the, uh, the nephew here, the man with the top hat, it says, Fred, Scrooge's nephew, click to hear what I'm thinking. Now, sometimes the audio takes a while to come in. It loads rather slowly. It's probably Merry a low. Christmas. It says, Merry Christmas, Uncle. And then Scrooge's response, you click on him. And hopefully you'll be able to hear him say, bah humbug. So these are taken from a 2009 movie um, under educational fair use. I don't think I'm depriving uh, Warner Brothers or whoever made the movie from any uh, revenue. So hopefully <coughs> it won't encounter any problems. There you go. Only once a year, sir. Let's see if we can get a bah humbug. Well, Ebenezer Scrooge. And here you can see he looks fairly uh, normal, but angry, right? He's got his business clothes on. And uh, again, everything you see here is um, just already pre-made, but it was assembled from the period times. And you can see a painting on the wall there from the Dickens Project. I believe that was... Uh, the Something Val was involved with, Val, the, I don't know how to say that, Sean Chai Library? Shawnee. Yep. Shawnee Library. And uh, so we kind of did a co-hosting there. Um, so the idea here is to set the tone for the novel, um, the classic tale by Dickens, A Christmas Carol, where it starts with the opening scene in The Counting House, and Bob Cratchit is, is sitting at his desk, and the nephew is saying Merry Christmas, and Scrooge says, bah humbug, and then he goes to sleep that night. So let's click on the magic door here. You can see on to see Marley's ghost. So I'll let you guys go ahead. 
on to see Marley's ghost. I'm getting some music here. Let's see if I can turn off that music. Okay. There, I think I got the music off. All right, so now we are in Scrooge's dream. So that night he uh, goes to sleep and he wakes up and the ghost of his former partner Marley is hanging over him and has oh. a terrible message for him. So if you click on Marley, thanks Val, you'll be haunted by three spirits. It's a bit low on the audio there. See if it's under sounds or uh, the lightning is under sounds. Perhaps it's under media. And then Scrooge also has a response. If you can click on Scrooge. And he says, he's really scared, basically. If you click on the different characters, you should be able to hear their, their thoughts. Yes. What do you want with me? Don't be hard upon me, Jacob. Um, you also, there's a ghost sitting on... Uh, on Scrooge's lap, so you have to kind of click on his cap what do you want with me? to hear the audio. What do you want with me? I hadn't figured out how to get rid of that little ghost sitting on his lap. The, the ghost came with the chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, so essentially, you set the scene for, uh, for uh, Scrooge's dream, and the ghost warns him that he'll be visited by three ghosts, one from Christmas past, one from Christmas present, and one from Christmas future. So you can see the magic doors here. One says Christmas past. One over there a bit farther away says Christmas present. And one says Christmas future. So students could come here in a, a whole class full of students and explore on their own pace. <clears throat> or they could just come at whatever pace they like you know, over the next week and then support it with an online discussion forum. Now, obviously, I put the Christmas past door closer because I kind of want to encourage them to go through it, uh, go through the story in chronological order, but they're welcome to go through whatever path they like. So let's all go to Christmas past. So click on the Christmas past. <coughs> But now you can see we're in the snowy vista of a small town. So I'll give people a chance to, uh, to all come through the door. And you can see some homeless people there. Um, and you kind of, it looks like we should probably go over this bridge because it's kind of the obvious path. So let's all walk over the bridge. And just like you saw back in the counting room where there was a big red sign, which I failed to mention, but at every scene there's a big red sign that kind of clues you in quite strongly. So again, no one's left behind puzzling too long. It says Fezziwig's Ball, Stave 2, Scene 1. And there's Scrooge in his dream with the ghost of Christmas past hovering over him. Now this uh, ghost is an example of Serafina's work, or Mrs. Coffey, as she's often known by. She created the ghost of Christmas past. She created the figure for Scrooge. So we can all kind of take a look here. And I made the, the figurines um, phantom, so you can just walk right in. And this is the scene from Fezziwig's Ball. And you can see that your cursor becomes a hand over Fezziwig. So I can click on Fezziwig to hear what he's thinking. 
and hopefully he'll say it soon. And the guy up there playing music, uh, I forget what they were called. Let's see if I can get some music out of him. There you go. So he's the guy playing the music, and Fezziwig says, No more work tonight. It's Christmas Eve. Now, I brought in a ragtag bunch of uh, different figures uh, to try to populate the place. Um, there's pirates. There's guys wearing armor. Um, there's the pirate. Um, oh, I'm blanking on his name. Uh, what's the actor's name? Somebody put it in chat, please. From the pirate... Uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, yes, Johnny Depp, <laughs> he's here, um, and you're not supposed to notice that, but uh, I wanted to get a, a fair range of people to build a tableau, so that's really kind of where I went with the story, was building a, uh, the key scenes using tableaus of characters and making them clickable so you can hear what they're thinking in that moment. Now this is a goal that students could also aspire to, they could build their own tableaus uh, from their own stories and present their own works. So this is kind of, a, I'm giving them a demonstration or an exemplar and hopefully they can build on this uh, this methodology. Now my kids are coming home from school here so I'm gonna um, talk to them one second, I'll be right back. Alright, the kids are coming home from school for they're on short days. Ah, uh, it'd be a jolly holiday. I'm sure that's what they'd be saying. And I'm sure some of these pirates are uh, lusting over the winches and looking forward to their dance. And I tried to, like, notice the tall gent there with the red outfit on. And he's already looking ahead to the woman that he's about to dance with. So try to make it realistic. Anybody have any questions about Get Scrooged? head out, walk through the people here. We'll be open this year at the holidays. If it's still funded, uh, Val, I sure hope so. Now, um, we are on Hong Kong U Education Island, and I am in the process of applying for another 12 months of funding. So I hope that uh, this island is funded again for another 12 months. And if it is, I'm happy to keep it here for the Christmas holidays. Oh, so if you have students that might want to experience a Christmas carol, as all my bills are, they're open to the public. And uh, again, Niesa did incredible work here. Just, um, she did her own research and she came up with her own ideas for the town. Now this is a fairly small skybox for this village. But if we go on, let's walk on to the next scene. Yes, Nias is also responsible for the weather. She does she set up the snow. Um, oh, I think a friend of hers was building the snow machine. So this is Scrooge breaking up with his fiance, Belle. And if you click on him, he says something about how he'd hate to be poor. Yes, he really doesn't want to be poor. And she says, I think someone else is taking over or something like that. So this is scene two, stave two. And they're kind of left here on their own devices. They can either go back through the door they came in. It looks like the same door they came in, but actually leads them back. Or they can wander on. And you can see I made it kind of bright over here to help them find the next door. And this next door will take them back to Get Scrooge Central. Now the snow is a little tricky because you it's hard something you have to get pretty close to click on the door. But let's all go ahead and go through the door and back to the, the central area. So everybody Pretty intense. My kids uh, see that snow and they're like, Daddy, when will we get to see real snow? <laughs> but you know, for a lot of kids in Hong Kong, a lot of even college students have never seen real snow. Yeah. So they get, they get quite a, a 
boost out of uh, seeing it here. Now if we turn down the sounds, you can turn down the thunder. So if the thunder's too loud, just go ahead and uh, click on your speaker symbol in the top right and turn down sounds. Uh-huh. Puerto Rico doesn't get any snow? Nope. Okay, well, we'll give them a bit of time to see if they can get through the door. There's XO. Glad you could join us. There's a bit of a traffic jam at the door. <laughs> yes. Now, this was definitely intended as more of a, a self-learning, um, individualized uh, science, <coughs> um, medium here. Um, not meant, as the medical training was, was intended for groups. This is more for people in ones and twos. And yes, it's hard to click through the snow, so you have to get really close to the door to, to, to get through. So if someone hasn't made it and you, can, and you know who they are and if you can uh, reach out and, and give them a, a TP, that might be helpful. Yep, the snow, um, it, it creates a problem for clicking on the door. Yes, thank you, Fidget. Check with Lear. Liar? I always hesitate to call her a liar. I did ask her one time, is it Lear or Liar? <laughs> All right, Val. Thanks for coming by. I'll see you soon. I'd hope that we can show people the uh, the next uh, Christmas present to show the big village, since it's such a big area that can be explored. But um, Maggie, are we up against another tour? Do, do we need no. to let people go on any time basis for another another presentation? Okay. Lear. That's what I said. Is it? I said Lear, and she said no. It's Liar. No, no, it's Lear. No, no. Oh, okay. No, no, it's well, Lear. Then, yeah. All right. Well, then let's Friends go with, with Lear. Seer. <laughs> I could see her. That makes sense. I could have sworn I asked you because I really hesitated to call you no, a liar. No, someone else said it's liar, <laughs> and I said, ooh. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. So it is Lear. All right. Well, I'm glad we got that cleared up. Lear. It's a musical instrument, isn't it? The lyre, you play the lyre no, with the a No, the lyre is a musical instrument, yes. Ah, uh, no I wonder. Yeah, that one. This is some right. um, abbreviated form of the Welsh for shapeshifter. Ah, uh, okay. Well, there you go. Is anybody left behind at this point? Should we wait? Or should I don't we think so. Go on to Christmas present. All right, XO, thanks for coming. Um, I encourage you, to, if you have time, to go to see Christmas Present because it's a really nice village that, uh, that Niesa has built. So I'm going to go through. This is a much larger venue here much larger village and same snow and I added some mountains off in the distance there to make it more believable snowy mountains so as much as I like the magic doors they do create a bit of a, a, a traffic bottleneck Niesa so again this this work here this large village is Niesa's work and that's one of her specialties, is creating a, a setting that gives an ambiance. And Nisa, can you tell us about the snow? Where did it come from? Perhaps you could share your friend who made the snow machine? Um, yes. Uh, Mrs. Coffey, who created the NPCs, her business partner created the the weather effects. <laughs> um, it also comes with rain and lightning and thunder and it's all the sounds go through your um, media rather than just the the uh, sounds where gestures play. It goes through media so you can turn it on and off if it's too loud. And, but it, they're great effects. It's the best you can get on SL and 
yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it can cause a little bit of lag if you don't have a very good computer, but um, it's the lowest lag uh, weather system you can get as well. Very nice. Thanks, Nia. So is there a website or a link to the creator that we could put in chat? Uh, yes, I'll just find one for you. Okay, great. So we can share that for anybody who's interested in this, this great weather. If you want to add snow or rain, um, I think this is probably the best system for weather effects. So I'm going to wrap up the tour here. As you can see, we're in front of the Cratchit family home, Christmas feast scene it's day three, scene one, and if you uh, want to come back and explore on your own, you can see the giant um, ghost that uh, Mrs. Coffee or Serafina made, and you can see the Cratchit family in one of their happy times with uh, Tiny Tim and everybody's sitting down to a meal. So this is a kind of my attempt at exploring the humanities. Rather than just stick to STEM subjects, I wanted to see how could Second Life, the affordances, the affordances mm. of the virtual world, be used to explore humanity, such as this classic literature. So if there's any questions, um, I think Gerard, I think you're about it, as far as the actual people in the tour. Grand hustle. OK, thanks, Nisa. That's all I have because he doesn't advertise the actual weather system on the marketplace, but you can get this particular snow um, on the marketplace, and it's called best uh, best snow. Very good. All right. I think he also does rain, doesn't he? Yes. Yeah. You can get so, uh, it. It's on a full sim. Uh, his uh, rain system. And wow. you can get the smaller versions that fit on a smaller parcel. I always so go for the size. big one. <laughs> yep. Yes, yeah. And just, this is the, the same system Nisa had at her haunted house, where she had it always pouring rain all the time to add oh, to the and bloom. <coughs> all right, well, I'm a little bit over time, quite a bit over time, but um, uh, thanks for coming. And Gerard, if you have any questions, or, um, and feel free to come back with uh, your students or friends who want to explore. Fidget, thank you very much for all your help. Always good to see you. Fidget is the little one right there, the little cat with the <coughs> sunflower. Yeah, Fidget's been coming to all of our, our course events, so um, we know and love Fidget, that's for sure. But thank you so much, Brent. This is astonishing. Um, I love that there's that contrast between the STEM stuff and and literature. And I'm I am definitely coming back and going through everything. And Niesa, your your builds are so rich and so detailed and so beautiful. Just really, really great environments. This has been a wonderful event. Thank you so much, Brent and Niesa. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Maggie. All right. You're welcome. 